before we start, before I'll wait for a, a couple of more minutes before others will come in. Uh, I want like a show of hands. How many of you here have used React or something like that? How many of you have used other forms of virtual DOM? Or okay, sure. Well, that's not a good sign. Okay, uh, so I was just asking how many of you have used React before? React is okay. None of you all. Okay, cool. How many of you have uh, heard of this programming language called Julia? Uh, one person. Okay. Um, so a lot of the things I'm doing here, uh, the server side part of it is in Julia. Actually, all code is server side. Uh, that's the whole point of this talk. Uh, so it's a very easy lang language. It's like the syntax is like uh, pseudocode. I haven't started yet. Yeah, I'm just uh, uh, yeah. So it's it's basically like pseudocode. So uh, I'm sure you guys you guys can figure it out. Um, so what Julia is is a it's a, a programming language for technical computing, which means it's uh, really good at number crunching, basically. Um, but it's also good uh, for general purpose programming. Uh, that's the kind of work I do uh, in, in my job. Um, well, uh, so if you haven't heard of Julia yet, uh, look it up. And there is a, a nice uh, article called Why We Created Julia, which explains why uh, they created Julia. And it's like uh, pretty ambitious and very nice. And I think we're almost there. Um, so is that, so yeah, I guess we have two more minutes, or should we start? Um, okay, looks like. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh. Okay, let's start. Okay, so hi everyone. I am Shashi Gowda. Uh, uh, from time to time, I make uh, UI packages for this uh, for users of this programming language called Julia. Uh, this talk is about uh, some of the work I did uh, on a package called Azure.jl. Uh, you can Google this to look it up. Uh, so my, the topic of my talk is uh, what can you do with a virtual DOM? Uh, on the server, right? So, uh, so, what is a virtual DOM? What does it even mean? And w does it actually work on the server? And the answer is yes. And I would settle for nothing less. Uh, so, I have a series of demos here, uh, and uh, I ha I'll tell you the number of lines of code it took to make those demos. And uh, uh, this uh, this code is written entirely in Julia, no JavaScript. So. Someone who has no JavaScript or HTML or CSS experience can come and use this package to make uh, really good looking UIs. So that's the idea, mm, at least. So the first demo is a UI for a recommendation system. So my friend Abhijit had, has, had written this, uh, uh, this recommendation system, which basically uh, takes ra ratings of movies from users and then creates a it does some linear algebra magic and figures out what you would like uh, to watch if you haven't watched it already. So uh, the, here's the recommender system. This is 33 lines of code uh, for the entire, uh, entire UI. So I can select different uh, people here. I mean, these people have really bad taste, but uh, yeah. So as I select, uh, select who, whose recommendation I want, uh, the thing keeps changing. Uh, the second demo I have is uh, a trade data viewer. I have a date picker widget here. Uh, if I just, yeah. Uh, so I can go select any of these dates that are highlighted. Uh, and then I have like a thing to search for things. Uh, and then I can uh, go s filter these tickers by categories. So if you notice, uh, those two checkboxes are synchronized. And uh, any guesses how many lines of code this was? 
these are all plots. This, uh, the code includes uh, uh, code to basically load the data and then plot these things using, uh, using a plotting library in Julia. Uh, so basically, uh, this thing is 194 lines of code, uh, which is a big deal, I think. Uh, and then I have this demo where I take a 2D FFT of my face. Okay. Okay. Um, there I am, and I can't see the FFT, so I'm just going to zoom out. Um, so, what's happening is that's the camera, and uh, to the right is uh, the FFT of whatever is being uh, read by the camera. Uh, this is 13 lines of code. I'm going to put some random images in front of the camera. Uh, to see, like, now you can see ripples over there, uh, which is the 2D FFT of a vaguely drawn circle. Uh, and this is a square. Uh, you can see, like, two perpendicular lines. And if I rotate this, that's going to rotate too. So the idea is you can do any sort of image processing and show it right next to it, and it'll be very simple. Like, the code you write is going to be about 15 lines. Uh, then I have the C.S. Princey's triangle, which is basically a triangle with, a, uh, so this is the number of steps to the C.S. Princey's triangle. So each time the triangle is divided into three parts and a step n minus one C.S. Princey's triangle is drawn. So it's like a recursive construction. So this is about 24 lines of code. Uh, and then I have a demo. Uh, uh, I have a Minesweeper demo, which is uh, 70 lines. Oh, shit. OK. Uh, so it's pretty feature complete. Uh, but as you can notice, the zeros do not propagate, which is like a bummer. But it works. So including the uh, styling, the icons, the shadows, the tiles. You cannot actually see, see the tiles. I think it's the, the projector. Uh, Everything, it's 70 lines, okay, so, and then I have this other demo where it's a simulation of birds flying around in, in the sky. So the flock vaguely attracts each other and comes together to the center, uh, but uh, when, when birds come too close, they start to ripple. Uh, and this is a simulation, it takes a while because it's loading the package and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, that's the uh, Boyd's demo. If you, if, you Google, if you Google for Boyd's pseudocode, you'll find a site with a pseudocode for this. And uh, so the algorithm is also included in this 84 lines. Uh, but how is this all done, right? So at some level, this has to come to the browser and get displayed. Uh, but I'm writing Julia code. Uh, what's happening, what's going on, right? So, so, of course, it has to come and become the DOM. So, first we need to understand what the DOM is, right? So, um, we all know what the DOM is. The DOM is a document object model in its expanded form. It's basically a convention where the browsers use a huge immutable, a huge mutable data structure uh, to represent the state of the page, right? Uh, uh, so, why is this, so this has served as okay till now, uh, but uh, DOM is state and state is inherently bad. Okay, so there there is a lot of research on this. The best mm -hmm. reference I think to get you like to get a feel of why state is bad is this paper called uh, Out of the Tar Pit by Ben Mosley. Uh, if if you have time, you should just check it out. Yeah. Uh, so, so state leads to this thing called combinatorial explosion. So what happens is, uh, at a, so basically an average person can hold less than 10 things in his head when he's working, uh, like it's the working memory capacity or something like that. So uh, a programmer is no different. I mean, if you're really smart, you could be like more than 10, but, uh, but, uh, but to put things in perspective, 50 bits of state 
can be in uh, 2 to the power 50 different configurations, OK? Uh, which is 10 to the power 15, uh, but there are like 10 to the power 11 starts in the Milky Way. Uh, so it's just going to explode. And uh, if someone else comes in and he's working on some code that uh, uses state that you wrote, and he changes the state that thing is going to be in, and then your go code is going to break, and uh, debugging this is going to be a pain. Uh, so the next thing uh, that comes with state is uh, callback-oriented uh, programming. You saw Bodil's uh, keynote, uh, which was all about like, subverting the callback style and state and using pure functions to write a game. Right? So, so state and call callback necessitate, necessitate each other. Uh, so basically, uh, what you do in the end of a callback is set the DOM state or set some state, right? Uh, it's not so good because state is not so good. Uh, and there is an increasing understanding that this is not ideal because you see these new frameworks like RxJS or uh, uh, React or, or languages like Elm, and they, they are all trying to come up with a better model for UI programming. Uh, than callbacks. Uh, so what is virtual DOM by us, right? So OK, first of all, what, what is a virtual DOM? A virtual DOM is a mock representation of the DOM. Uh, it's a JavaScript data structure or any other uh, language's data structure. It's a data structure, basically, uh, which maps directly to the DOM. And uh, what it enables uh, is uh, this very simple model of programming. Uh, so your UI becomes just a function which, which takes some data and returns a UI, OK? Uh, so uh, which is very easy to understand because so the, the return value only depends on the inputs to that function and nothing else, no other state, right? Uh, so what you're doing actually fits in your head. And so there's a clever trick which makes uh, virtual DOM feasible because if you create a virtual DOM at each state, progression of your app, and then you go redraw the entire DOM, it's not going to be efficient. So what virtual DOM uh, libraries do is they take a diff of uh, two virtual DOMs, and then figure out what exactly changed, and go and apply those patches to the actual DOM. So what, what happens is efficiency is managed for you. You end up with a declarative model for programming. You just create the UI and be done with it. Uh, whenever state changes. You don't have to explicitly go and change some uh, part of your UI. You just generate it, and uh, Virtual DOM is going to figure out what changed and actually do the work. Uh, and uh, Virtual DOM gets along very well with this thing called functional reactive programming, which was the topic of Bodil's uh, uh, keynote. Uh, so I'm going to talk about functional reactive programming towards the end. Uh, but basically, it's a escape hatch from this uh, callback hell, basically. Um, OK. So over to the dark side. Uh, virtual DOM on the server. Uh, how does this work? Uh, so I'm going to talk about this library called Azure. But building up to that is this thing called patchwork.jl, which is a substrate, which is basically uh, the most minimal virtual DOM implementation. Uh, and it directly maps to this other JavaScript library called virtual-dom by, uh, by Matesh. Uh, it's an excellent library, very well tested, and a single purpose library. And it's also fast. Uh, sorry about that. OK. Um, so what happens is patchwork.jl generates these virtual DOM nodes on the Julia side. Oh, uh, in, uh, in Julia, we have the convention of uh, appending .jl to all packages. Uh, that's the .jl. So it generates this virtual DOM data structure, it serializes it to JSON, and sends it over to the browser, where Matt's uh, virtual DOM is going to pick that uh, JSON up and then draw, draw the actual DOM. Okay, so I'm going to show some examples. So patchwork.jl, the lowest level of this abstraction, uh, provides the LM type using which I can create normal HTML. Like, basically, this is a div. And uh, this is hello world. And th the text goes inside. And I have this uh, dictionary, which is a style, OK? Uh, 
which is the style of this thing. So I can go here. Uh, this is actually a, a interactive editor, so I can make it black and press Control Enter, and uh, it becomes black. Uh, so you can keep adding things to this uh, if you want to. Font size, okay. font size. Uh, I don't know, two em maybe. So it's going to become bigger and stuff like that. Uh, uh, yeah. So the ne next example. So this also extends to SVG, right? So since I'm writing Julia code, I have abstracted out creation of a circle into this function called MK circle, which takes the x, y coordinates of the center and the radius, and optionally a color, and then draws these circles, right? Uh, draws a circle, returns a circle, which I'm going to put it in a SVG tag. So the first argument here is actually the namespace, and the second argument is the tag. So as you can see, SVG circle, SVG, SVG, and I have a bunch of circles here. Uh, um, let's try and make this guy look creepy. Uh, so red, red, I don't know, seven, seven. Yeah, um, well, so it extends nicely to SVG. What else does it extend to? Uh, it extends to HTML5 custom elements as well, which means that uh, you can have, uh, you can define your own custom HTML elements uh, uh, and have custom behavior. For example, this is the Katek element that I wrote. It's a wrapper around Khan Academy's tech uh, library. Uh, LaTeX library, basically. So what is so the API I have created in the in the custom element is uh, there is a source attribute which takes uh, which takes the LaTeX code and then uh, it typesets it to LaTeX. And this block thing basically means that it's a block or inline uh, inline thing. Uh, so I can edit this thing here. If I can make this four, the formula is wrong now. I can put it back. So one more thing I have is uh, one more. Oh, so I wanted to show you one more thing. So if I inspect the uh, inspect this element, although I'm just creating one DOM element, which is k dash tech, uh, I have all these different uh, smaller elements which which go inside the shadow DOM of of that parent element. So this is not visible to virtual DOM, and it need not be, right? So that's the beauty of it. Everything is encapsulated in this one custom element. And uh, yeah, it just works. Uh, OK. So coming back to Azure.jl, so that's, that's patchwork. Now we are building uh, abstractions on top of this uh, virtual DOM library. Uh, uh, so abstraction one, converting Julia values to UIs, right? As simple as that. Uh, oh, I wanted to show one more thing. Uh, so this code editor I'm using is just one, one, uh, you know, I can just, it's just a, a custom HTML element again. So I just created a code mirror and then I got a code mirror to the right. Uh, so yeah, converting Julia values to virtual DOM. So first off, uh, textual values, uh, yeah, hello world works. You can also have numbers. Why is this not working? Okay. Okay, I might need to reload this thing. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, it's going to be hard, but I'll try. Um, oh God. Okay, I haven't got. Uh, I, I I have to reload this thing to make it work, because I seem to have changed something in the code and. Not reloaded the page. Okay. Uh, so I can have markdown. This is a string macro called MD. 
Uh, so as you can see, uh, the world became italicized. Uh, I can do this. I don't know, open web conf, and that becomes bold. I can have multi-line markdown strings. Uh, oh, these are just comments for my reference later on, so ignore them. Uh, I can have like Julia code here, function foo, whatever. And if I run that, I get a type like a syntax highlighted code, code, code thing. And then I can inline, I think this will work. Let's see. LaTeX, yeah. I'm inlining LaTeX uh, in, into this thing. Uh, let that take some time to load. Uh, so that's Markdown. Uh, I was showing Code Mirror before. Uh, so I uh, yeah I showed you these two things. Now I have this thing called uh, there's this thing called SymPy, which is uh, uh, which is a a library for dealing with symbols in mathematics. So I, I'm creating a symbol called x, and then I'm differentiating sine x squared with, uh, with respect to x five times, and that's the simplified expression I got. And it automatically gets typeset and converted into a virtual DOM and displayed on the screen, right? So uh, I can change this number to whatever, 20, and it's going to go out of the screen, but sure. Yes, SymPy is a Python package, but Julia can call Python package packages. So, yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is compose.jl. It's a package for declarative vector graphics. Uh, it's similar to something called diagrams in Haskell. Um, actually, it's uh, it's become completely different now, but uh, that's the inspiration. Uh, so here's the Sierpinski triangle code that I was showing you. Uh, so basically what we are doing is if n equals zero, we are just drawing, the, drawing a triangle in, in, in the context. And then if it's not, then we are dividing the context into three different, rec three different uh, uh, smaller contexts and then drawing, drawing the n minus one Sierpinski triangle there. So this is like a recursive thing. If you think about it hard enough, you'll understand how this works. Uh, uh, for brevity, I am going to uh, go to the next slide. Yeah. So I had text over here. So this, so the content this time is is a plot. So there's this library called Gadfly, which which lets you uh, draw a nice plots. Okay. So uh, Gadfly returns an immutable value which can be converted into virtual DOM, right? It's, it's basically converted first into, uh, it's converted to uh, SVG virtual DOM and then shown on this, uh, on the browser. Uh, that's how this works. So if I just uncomment this, uh, this is a cooler plot, but it takes a while to, uh, while to finish. Okay, that's a contour plot. So it's, it's like plotting a function, uh, and like telling you how hot the function is at different places. Uh, okay, abstraction two, uh, layouts. Uh, in Azure, uh, we do not use CSS style layouts. Uh, so the, here's, here's an example. Uh, I have this box one, uh, which is uh, creating this container of 10 EM and 10 EM, and then filling it with the color. And I have, there's this uh, package called color in, in Julia. It's like the most extensive color manipulation package out there. Uh, so what color has is all these uh, color maps and color scales. So you can just call to color and it'll give you a list of colors. Uh, so I'm, I'm just getting seven reds here and uh, creating two boxes with uh, the third and the fifth red respectively. And then I have this thing called VBox, which is going to put two boxes, put two, uh, put two uh, any of uh, Azure UIs uh, vertically, one, one below the other, right? So uh, 
So what if I wanted to give, us, uh, give some space between those two? In CSS, you will have to figure out like, which one to pad or which one to give a margin to. I don't want to do that. That's like extra overhead. So I'm just going to do this thing called vSkip, which is going to give us space over there. And similarly, I can do this uh, with HBox, and it aligns horizontally. Uh, and the really cool part uh, which I want to drive home is all these things are values. So you can, you can generate them as you would any other Julia value. Here's a list comprehension where I'm creating a container of, uh, of size, uh, 1 to 7 EM uh, square containers, and filling them with all the colors that I created in the color map. Uh, and then I'm going to put them in a V-box. OK. OK. OK, so they got stacked up like that. And uh, uh, I can put them in an H-box as well. But let's just try a V-box for now. Um, so say you wanted to give some interspersed uh, some space between all of these, right? Uh, in CSS, you would have to give like a padding to one of them, uh, like a top padding to all of them, and then uh, select the first one and not give a padding there because you want you don't want space there. So uh, padding or margin, I mean whatever. Uh, so how you would do this in uh, in Azure is you say intersperse. And uh, you say vskip, uh, 1em, and then boxes. And it's going to return a new list with uh, inter, interspace, interspace. Sorry. Interspace. OK. It's going to return a new list with all these things interspersed. So it gets stacked properly. And uh, you can do it with a hitchbox as well. Uh, but I need to give it skip instead. So uh, uh, this this is based on Flexbox. So you can just show this. I'll just show. You can flex a box, and it's going to fill up the entire space, uh, entire remaining space. Uh, you can, if you want to, like give as much spacing between two things as possible. Then you can say flex, and it's going to just create a container which just expands and pushes these two things out. Uh, so this is more tractable, I think, than CSS layouts. Uh, and then there is padding, uh, which is which is kind of different from from CSS. I'll show you how. If I fill if I fill a pa padded uh, padded container, uh, it's actually going to fill it outside. So what pad is doing is it's actually wrapping it in, inside another div, uh, and then uh, giving, the, giving a padding to that div. This makes things more predictable, because I can have multiple paddings to the same element. And uh, yeah, it's going to, uh, yeah. See, box one, box one, I had already defined before in, in some previous slide. Oh, yeah, here. And that has this pink color. And uh, now I've, I've padded the box one. I've got a new box now, OK, with the padding. That's it. And then I fill that box. The padded container gets filled, OK? Uh, OK, I have this other thing called inset. Uh, which is, OK, I'm going to give it some indenting so that you can see it. Huh, so pipe is basically, uh, so in, in Julia, when you say pipe, some value, and pipe f, it's, uh, it's similar to saying f of v. OK, so what, uh, what uh, fill color tomato is returning it's a, is a function of one argument, which, which is the which is the UI to fill the color of, fill, fill the color. 
Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Julia actually does not have automatic currying, but I have a macro which generates all these methods for me. So, uh, so that's how the pipe operator works as a digression. But uh, so I have this function called insect, uh, and I give it to I give to it uh, a container that I want to place my uh, place another box inside uh, instead of this, I'll just use box two because it's smaller, I think, yeah. So I can tell, I want to offset this, I want to place this inside of uh, another container, but offset is from the middle, uh, 5 EM along x direction, 4 EM along y direction, and it just works. And if I, if I just uh, remove this offset and just say middle, that also works. It just places it in the middle. Vertical centering, yay. Uh, yeah, sure. So it's in all these demos I'm showing. It's the last value that is returned that that gets that gets rendered. Uh, so this is a quote by uh, from from Magic Inc. It's an essay by Brett Victor. So he says that CSS is so complex that it has never been implemented correctly. Uh, yet successive uh, uh, versions specify even more complexity. At the same time, it's so underpowered that uh, many elementary graphic designs are impossible or prohibitively difficult. Okay, so uh, most CSS lore is about how to circumvent CSS's weirdness and stuff like that. Right. So he also goes on to tell what the problem actually is, and he says that uh, the fault is that the languages attempt to serve as both a tool and a platform. Right? Thereby su succeeding at neither. So what Escher tries to do is it, it tries to use CSS as sort of a, uh, so, a sort of a bytecode, if you will. So it has these higher-level abstractions which compile down to the complicated CSS that you don't want to write. Right? Uh, at least that's how I see it. Uh, so this is layout two, which is like higher-order layouts. Now we want to. In a decent web app, we want to have like tabs and toolbars and stuff. And Azure allows you to do that. Here's my tab, and in an H box, I'm putting an icon, and then saying vector graphics, uh, and then plots here, and then these are my pages. In the vector graphics page, I have Sierpinski, and then in the plot page, I have a plot of sine and cos. So I need to wire these things up. And that, this is how I do it, like wire t comma p. It's, it's going to return a new t and p, which, which, which are now connected. Okay? So this is because of the functional nature of this thing. I cannot say, set this to that, set this to this. And uh, so it, instead, I have a function which takes these two things and returns two things, right, which are now connected. Uh, so if I click on this, sure enough, it changes. Uh, OK, abstraction three, typography. Uh, it's simple. Uh, so we have two type scales, which are loosely based on material design. Uh, as you can see, I've created both in a list comprehension uh, and put them in a vbox. Right? So this is all well and good. Uh, so far, we saw how to make static things. How do you do interactivity? Right? I sh so in the demos I showed you, there were animations. There were all these sorts of uh, like sliders and shit, stuff like that. Uh, so the story so far has been our UI is just some function applied to the data that we want to display. Uh, how do we get to the time dimension, right? How do we get to the interactive dimension? So we turn to reactive programming for this. Uh, a great inspiration for this uh, is uh, Elm, uh, a very well-designed language. Also, Ivan Chaplicki's uh, thesis is very well written. It condenses like 30 years of FRP research into very uh, digestible thesis. Uh, so there's this pr package called reactive.jl, which is an implementation of Elm signal library in Julia. Uh, uh, so FRP in, um, in, in Julia and Elm uh, uh, is based on this type called signal, OK? So, uh, so I'm going to uh, like briefly introduce what signals do. Uh, they're like uh, reactive uh, extension observables that you saw in the keynote. 
but uh, slightly different. Uh, so we want some data which varies over time, uh, apply some function to it, and then show it as the output. That's what we want to do like uh, at a very high level, right? So think of signals as uh, signals in circuitry, right? Uh, that's, that's a very good model to start off, I think. So, so the first principles of signals, right? So these are sort of the axioms that we assume that signals, all signal values uh, sort of satisfy. So a signal always has a value. Uh, that's the first axiom. And the second one is uh, the value held by a signal can change as time passes, right? Very simple. Uh, so how do we create a signal? Uh, so at the most basic level, there's the input signal. Uh, an input signal is created uh, with the input constructor, and you have to specify an initial value to it, right? So int signal is a signal which has the zero, uh, which has zero as the initial value. Now, and then the value held by that signal can be changed with a push call. So the push operator takes a signal and the, then a the number updates the value of the signal at, at that current time, right? So this is sort of the functions that work on signals and give you more signals. Uh, you can say it's like the algebra of signals or something like that. So there is firstly consume, which takes a function and a signal. And for every update to that signal, it applies the function and then returns a new signal with whose values are the functions, the function applied to each update, right? Uh, so it's basically like math or uh, it's also called lift uh, because it, it lifts you into the time dimension or something like that. Uh, and then there is foldl, which is basically uh, the scan function in RxJS that uh, Boril was showing. So it takes a function of two arguments. The first argument is the uh, current accumulated value, and the next argument is the update in the signal. And then it keeps adding them uh, or, or combining them using this function. Uh, I'm going to show an example of fold. It's going to become really simple. And then there's filter for filtering only certain values in, in a signal. The, so the updates get dropped if, if the function does not satisfy. And then merge can merge multiple signals into one signal. And then drop repeats will drop any repeats in a signal. And then keep when takes a Boolean signal and another signal. And only when the Boolean signal is true, the other signal is updated. That's the output of keep when. And then FPS takes a floating point number and gives a signal which updates that many FPS num uh, uh, that many numbers number of times. And FPS when uh, has a switch also. It's consume. Uh, there's no subscribe here. It's just consume. So if you want to show a uh, show a thing that updates, you just show like a signal of UIs, and it works. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, you can think of it as consume, right? So I'm going to show some examples. Uh, it's going to become, uh, cl become clearer. So, uh, so it, an input is just like a wire with some initial voltage. And then, so I'm starting off the input with the value zero. And then I am going to create a slider over here and then subscribe the slider to the, to, to the steps input. Uh, so it's basically like attaching uh, a slider, the output from a slider to this input. Uh, so now I have a new slider which is connected to this input. Okay. Now I put put this slider in a V box along with this thing. And what this thing is is it's basically consuming steps, uh, the steps signal, and applying the Sierpinski uh, function at each step, at each update. Right. So. Now when I update the signal, it's going to change. So it's pretty simple. Uh, everything is on the screen and uh, easy to think about. Uh, so here's an uh, example of an animation. So I have a switch here at the top, if you, can, if you noticed. Uh, so the switch state is a signal again. Uh, and I, I, I made the switch a toggle button. So when I toggle that button, uh, the switch state is going to update to false, uh, update to true or false, depending on the state of the toggle button. And then I have this ticks function, which is going to, uh, it's, it's basically a call to FPS when. So only when the switch is on, it's going to emit updates at 60 FPS, right? Uh, and then I have this, uh, 
the snow show ball function, which takes an argument and returns the position, returns a picture of the ball at that, that particular instance. Okay. Uh, so then I'm putting, I'm basically putting uh, the switch in a V box with with the show ball signal, which takes the ticks. Uh, now if I turn this on, the ball is bouncing. Uh, that's because of the uh, cute math over here. So it's like 0.1 plus 1 minus absolute of sine, uh, which is essentially what a bouncing ball does. Uh, so we saw two, two widgets now, so a slider and a toggle button. So what makes a widget, right? So, we are, so, if, uh, so you might be thinking that uh, I have some JavaScript which has some callback and then, uh, uh, so I, yeah, but we didn't write any of that stuff here, right? It's all ultimately virtual DOM, right? So, uh, so there is this abstraction which is below widgets. So widgets use this thing called behavior. So anything in, in Azure can have a behavior, like I'll give you an example. So there's a behavior called clickable, which makes any, any Azure UI a clickable, clickable element. Uh, so I have this uh, thing called click me here, and I'm making, it, uh, I'm making it a clickable thing. Now I can subscribe to, uh, uh, now I can subscribe to uh, this thing because it has a behavior. Uh, so I'm subscribing uh, over here to the click signal, uh, click signal, which has the initial value of left button. Uh, because when I click on this thing, it's going to update to some uh, update to the button I clicked on. So, so if I keep cl keep clicking here, notice that the counter keeps updating. It's going to increment. So that's the uh, foldel doing all the work. Uh, so it's taking the clicks, and then it's starting off with zero, and then at each step it's applying this anonymous function. This is an anonymous function in Julia, by the way. So uh, this is the anonymous function. I'll just explain what it does. So these two are the arguments to the anonymous function, and then this is the return value, basically. So, so it's taking the previous counter and then returning one plus that counter, okay, and then ignoring the click. So as you can see, it's uh, counting the number of clicks I make. Uh, oh, you, can, you can't actually see that I'm clicking, but I am. Uh, so let's inspect the DOM here, right? So I have this thing called, it's in a span, uh, click me. And then there's all these weird custom elements, right? So I'll tell you what each one does. Clickable behavior adds a uh, event listener to the parent. So basically, the, now, now the span becomes, span has a clickable, I mean, span has a click uh, event listener. And then signal transport, because we have subscribed to a click signal, it tells that when, when, the, when the behavior updates, go, to, go back to the server and tell that it updated. And tell that this specific uh, signal leads to update, right? So this is again a, a custom element. It's very, uh, it's encapsulated in its own, uh, its JavaScript is encapsulated inside. And then there is the stop propagation, which stops the click from bubbling out and causing problems elsewhere, right? Um, no, the clickable behavior is having a listener to the click event because that's its job. And then it's going to raise a signal, uh, raise a event called signal dash update, which is, which is what signal transport watches for. It can watch for any signal update. So you can have uh, like a slider, which is uh, actually giving out like the value of the slider, but you can signal transport it with the same way just by. Sure, but but the whole point is you want things to happen on the server uh, in this case, right? Uh, so this is a very trivial example, but for most things, you probably want to go to the server. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's right. So how does that, can you use any other kind of 
I'm going to answer that in the end. Let me just finish my talk now, OK? Sorry. Uh, um, other behaviors are has state, key press, uh, that is like draggable, which is very alpha, and then like series sizable as well. Uh, and then there is like a camera listener and all that. Uh, so using these abstractions, we can build these things. So and there is this uh, one more thing called interpreters, which is like purely Julia side. Uh, interpreters are meant to like interpret messages from the client, uh, so to speak. Why do you need interpreters? Because when I was clicking on those things, it was actually making it into a uh, Julia value, which is the which is the constant uh, called left button. So I want interpreters to do all that stuff. So it's it's an abstraction uh, between the client and the signals, right? Uh, so interpreters allow us to decode and augment messages coming from the browser. So an example of an interpreter is this constant interpreter, which to which you give a value. And uh, every time there is an update in this widget, it's going to send that value to your uh, input. Oh, by the way, this is just subscribe. I should have not introduced this here. So that's an alias to subscribe. Um, I mean, it just, yeah, so. What? That's not good. Did I change something? My computer is hung now. Oh, it's, it's trying to load the fonts or something, and there's no internet. <sighs> All right, so. Where? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, that may not be the problem, because. There's something else happening here. OK, let me just go to the end and get it back. Uh, OK, uh, so there you go. Uh, so what's happening is the delta signal is getting updated with the delta. So when I click on, uh, click on the minus button, it's, it's sending the constant minus 1 to that signal. When I click on the plus button, it's sending the constant 1 to that signal. And my fold is just adding. So plus is a uh, function of two arguments, which adds two things. To it. So it's adding whatever delta is coming in. So I'm just displaying the count over here, and it's a nice little counter. The button is the uh, polymer, yes. So all these nice widgets you saw are, again, uh, polymer custom elements. OK. So, so a widget is a UI plus behavior plus interpreter. Uh, so, um, so all all widgets have an, a default interpreter and a default behavior. Uh, for example, the slider has a default behavior of watch state, which is like watch the state of my uh, my whatever child, and then it has a interpreter called two type real, which is going to convert the uh, slider value into a real real value, real as in mathematics real value like a, a float or a integer, depending on the range you get. OK. Uh, so I have this example that I want to show. Oh, this slideshow it was made with Azure, and this is how it looks. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, like a, it's like a series of V boxes, and then there is this function called slideshow, which takes a list of slides and makes you a slideshow. Uh, and then, OK, I'll just show you the recommender system demo right, right, away, uh, right now and uh, try to edit that thing. Where is it? Where is it? OK, there it is. OK, um, so, so what my friend Abhijit gave me is this. Appropriate? No, no, this will be more easier. So the Minesweeper is actually using the constant thing to get the get the coordinate of the tile that was clicked, and it's like that. That's what makes the whole thing so short, I think. So I was given this function called recommend, which takes a user and an n, and then gives me back uh, n recommendations for that user. Okay, and this this return value is like a list of movie names, 
but I have this JSON file which I got by scraping IMDB uh, with like a list of certain movies, and uh, I can look look up uh, look up the the out, uh, the movies in the output in, in this JSON file and like figure out what's the poster, what's the uh, caption, or what's the genre and stuff. Uh, so I have this function called show movie. This is your so in, in, in a CSS JavaScript HTML setup, this would be a template, right? Uh, so it takes a movie object and then gets the data from the JSON file. So the get field is doing all the hard work from, of getting it uh, and checking if it actually exists and all that. Uh, and then it uh, increases the size. Uh, it, it sets the size of that image. And then it has this DESC thing. This, it's the description which goes to the right of the image. Right, so it's just a V box with the with the movie name, and then uh, the the plot of the movie, and then the genre. Uh, so, and finally, it returns a H box of the of the poster, and a two EM space between the poster and the description. Right, so that's that's one of these things. Yeah, Tom and Huck. Let's see. Uh, so this is a H box with with the name, uh, the plot, and the and the uh, and the genre, and then it's next to an uh, image because it's in the edge box. Uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm just mapping over all the returned recommendations and calling show movie on each one of them, and then it returns a new list, and then I'm interspersing some space and a line between all of them. Uh, between so this this is what is getting interspersed the line and the this thing. So you can see that there's an edge line function in Azure which just draws a horizontal line. If you, are, if you are doing a horizontal stacking, you can use the V line function which will draw a vertical line. Uh, hmm. I think we are out of time. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So consume of user signal, uh, oh, the do block, yeah. So the do block is basically a syntactic sugar. Uh, so the first argument was the function before, right? So what this does is it creates a lambda, uh, it creates an anonymous function with one argument and then puts it as the first argument. So it's a syntactic, a syntactic sugar that Julia provides. So I'm just making use of it. Uh, so let's just say I want like a, I'm not cool with just 10 recommendations. I want to see more or less. So. I basically ha add these three lines, right? So the first one is I create a new signal, uh, which which has the which holds the n, and then uh, basically, yeah, consume both of them, right? So consume is a is a variadic function, which means that it can take any number of signals, and then. The, and then the function it takes will need to have that many number of arguments. So right now I have this, and uh, I just put a slider which which is subscribed to the send signal. Uh, and if I go back here and reload, it takes a while because it actually trains when I reload the page. Uh, okay. Okay. So. Oh, is it? Uh, oh, wait one second. Let me just see what's wrong here. Oh, yeah. So the end is set to ten. So, uh, Minesweeper was not working on Mozilla. Oh, okay. I have to look into like testing all these other browsers. But I mainly work on Chrome. Um, so productionizing this stuff is my next goal. Like, we've been documenting it and like things like that. So oh yeah, as you can see, this thing works. So I have 49 recommendations now. Um, so with like three lines of code, you added one more dimension to this whatever UI you had. Uh, so it's kind of easy to write uh, UIs in Azure. Okay, so thanks to all these people. For, for the inspiration and code. So firstly, Elm, 
uh, Ivan Chaplicki uh, has written a great programming language and, and a very nice thesis. Uh, and then Virtual Dom uh, by Matesh, uh, which is like patchwork.jl is like a verbatim translation of Virtual Dom to Julia. Uh, and then Polyver for all those beautiful widgets and uh, some helper, helper um, custom elements for making more Polymer elements. And uh, Katek for the LaTeX. And, and on the Julia side, uh, Compose and Catfly written by Daniel C. Jones. Uh, amazing libraries. Uh, and then Images by Tim Holy, which was what I was using for the image processing demo. And then SymPy, which is like a wrapper around SymPy, the Python module. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, um, response of, so the, the response of the virtual DOM, you mean? Uh, so you can just inspect the elements and that's how you see what it becomes. So uh, that's actually described in the virtual DOM uh, um, readme. Uh, so it's basically this data structure. Uh, I just showed you the div and then a bunch of DOM properties, which just become, which just gets set to the uh, to the element that gets created. So it's a direct mapping between this data structure and the DOM. I mean, there is nothing fancy about it. Like, uh, let me just go back to that slide where I showed the LM type. <coughs> yeah, so what happened there? Ah, so, so the style is a, so style of a DOM element is actually like a, JavaScript object, which has exactly these contents, right? That's what this is uh, creating. This is just creating the exact same thing that the browser represents in the DOM, and then it just gets applied. One-to-one -one mapping. Any other questions? Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, you can actually inspect this thing over here, and you'll see that this is actually a div with all these styles over here, uh, so the color is white, padding is 1EM and all that. Uh, and then it contains the hello world text. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, okay, if there are no questions, thanks a lot. <laughs>